I worked at Ericsson when it was basically mostly right in the, in the building in the picture. And my office and everybody else's looked about like the one in the picture. That's not me, but it could easily have been me. Notice cubicles, okay. At that point, Erlang had been being developed for, oh, about 15 years or so, something like that. And it had been stable for maybe five. Of course, not stable the way it is now, but still very good. There were 19 um, products being developed with Erlang. And yet Erlang wasn't popular. People did not want to learn how to program Erlang. It was considered a bad career move. So Ericsson forbid the use of Erlang because it wasn't being used enough. At that point, a guy named Hoke Milroth came by my office with a, a, an article to read called The, the Cathedral and the Bazaar, which is a open source, uh, what is open source uh, article. I had never heard of open source before. And he said, this is what we need to do. And so that is what I did, okay? I got the Ericsson management to release Ericsson Erlang open source. At that point, we knew that Erlang wouldn't be popular in Ericsson for quite some time, time even so. Um, so the gang that had been most hurt by uh, the decision to forbid Erlang's use in Ericsson came up with a, they said they wanted to start a company. And I said, fine, let's start a company. Do you guys realize how much work it is? Not a problem, it, well, let's start a company. And I said, well, yeah, okay, but we need a business idea first. And I thought I was safe from having to start a company at that point. Because basically nobody has good business ideas, I thought. But this gang, they had 41. We met at Joe's house uh, on a Saturday and they had 41 business ideas and we had to choose, okay? That was an amazing experience. Absolutely incredible, never had anything like it. We chose something called Blue Tail, which was clustering uh, for servers. So you could have a couple of servers that took over from each other uh, on web services. This is now 1998, late 1998. Okay, and the, on the uh, 1st of January, 1999, we started a company called Blue Tail. Um, there's a picture from the time, uh, I'm a little younger there. So are the heroes, the actual heroes of Blue Tail, you see a few of them there, Hokan and Klake and Yuan and Martin and yeah, Jokke, right? Um, right, so we started this. We thought that uh, clustering would be a good idea because then web services would not have to go down and that would be a good thing. Um, it was a good thing, but I had basically learned how to do businesses from my parents, who are the small business people, and also from the then uh, structures of the time, the, what you learned in school then, which was to write a business plan. Uh, it doesn't work like that. So when we sold it, it was more than time to sell. We had no sales traction. Customers were not interested in our products. We were six weeks from bankruptcy when the whole deal was signed, which was nervous. Uh, at the time, the tech bubble was bursting. We sold in the summer of 2000. Uh, so the tech bubble had already been burst in three months, but people were still hoping that it would come back again, right? But we did have amazing technology. It really did work. And we had, of course, an amazing tech team. These are the people that invented Airline. They know what they're doing, okay? So it was about like this in a lot of the, um, it looked like this in the tech uh, events back then. Uh, we had mob scenes uh, around our technology. Uh, people really wanted to see how it worked. Uh, and everybody else's stands were empty for a while there. And then once in May 2000, we realized that, oh, gee, suddenly other people that we have space around our stand and the big guys, the IBMs of the world, were promising that they could do what we did, although we knew they couldn't, but they got the crowds in their stands instead. So we realized that, oh, 
okay, everybody wants to promise they do what we do, but they can't. The person, the, the company buying us will be able to keep their promises and nobody else will. Uh, so it's time to sell. And we sold, okay? It was a big success, although it wasn't a very successful company as a company, right? So I've learned a bit since then. I have to cut focus on customer value. What customers actually want? What do they actually think is valuable with this? There's a whole new methodology one uses, the way to do a startup. It's called Lean Startup. It works a whole hell of a lot better than the one that was 20 years ago. It actually works, which is great. And then I've had a hell of a lot of experience with startups. Already then in Blue Tide, I'd had a few small ones, uh, but now I've done a few more. Um, rather a number more. Um, I've had a very, I and now my family have had a, a few roles. We've been co-founder and CEO, uh, me of Blue Tail and Teclo, Caroline of Volumental. I've been on management teams. I've been an investor mostly. I've been a working chair. Uh, I've been just on the board and I've just been, just been an investor. And it turns out that it's quite clear the correlation isn't 100%, but it's easily 70 or 80% that the, um, the more I work in a startup or the more that we work in a startup, the better it goes. Okay, so we've taken some lessons from that. And one of them is that we don't, we do at most two startups each at most and work about half time the first few years, two, three, four years um, in each one of them. Uh, in order to get you know things sort of settled and, and stable and then pass off to the next people who do the scale, the scale up of something that actually has you know, customer value and sales traction and a familiar in, in a functioning organization and um, all the contracts necessary and um, know where they are on the value chain and all that sort of thing. Okay. So this is a lot of experience. I've also been startup uh, coach uh, for, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 startups. Uh, I'm in something called the Creative Destruction Lab, which is mostly in Canada and in the States, but also in uh, Oxford, where I'm mostly, and in Paris. So it's spread out. It's for deep tech startups. Um, and I also work in, in Stockholm with a lot of tech startups. But mostly, I'm just, at the moment, I am chair of Graphmatic and board member of Race Fox, and that's it. That's as much as I really can do and do well. And so this is us a few years ago. Um, we're all three entrepreneurs, and that's what you get. Um, right, so what is it that one actually uses nowadays in terms of how to start a startup? Okay. What is the theory now? Well, there's the old things. There is, for instance, the Porter's Five Forces up here, uh, where you figure out where your industry is, what's, what your startup's weaknesses and strengths are, and what the industry is like. Um, whether you have a lot of customers, which is a good thing because none of them can negotiate very hard, or only a few, which is a bad thing because then they negotiate very hard. A lot of suppliers, very good. You're buying pens, you can buy it from many places. One supplier, not quite as good, uh, because then they can negotiate hard. They can put up their prices until you don't have anything left. Uh, those kind of strategic forces. There is something called the business model canvas that comes from uh, this lean startup stuff, and that is really key. Uh, there are free templates for all of the contracts you need, at least in Sweden. I think it's in Denmark, Norway, Estonia, Iceland as well. Uh, free templates, all the contracts you need to start with. Perfectly good contracts. Uh, of course, any lawyer worth their salt will uh, say that they're not good enough because they want to keep their business, but as a startup, you don't want to spend money on, on um, documents particularly. It's much better to spend it on meeting customers, so use the, the standard perfectly good contracts. How to sell. Uh, that's new rack on screen selling. It's old, it's good, it's exactly what you do. 
there is how to influence people, which is how I got Ericsson's management to do, to release Ericsson Airline open source. Uh, and then there's how to manage in a larger organization, which is basically high output management by the more Intel guy. This is excellent stuff, all of it. Um, but really, with that amount of, <laughs> with that amount of uh, successful, actually, many of them, um, startups under my belt, draw on my lipstick face, I really would love to answer your questions. This is what I want to do is just introduce myself. Why do I know this stuff? I'm not perfect. I don't haven't known this forever at all. Uh, but I do this for a living and have done for 20 years or so, 25. Okay. There. So please ask questions. And I think Michael, you know a few. Yes, we have some questions already. Uh, let Good. me read the first one here. I have. Um, you are the CEO of the first airline startup, Blue Tail. How was it uh, like managing Joe, Robert, Clark, and the rest of the amazing team of co-founders? They are wonderful people. Uh, I knew then and I know thou now that I am really not as good at technology as they are, really not. Uh, so we agreed on what, what we were doing together and uh, let them do what they wanted to do. There were a couple of problems, okay? One of them when we, we had already been sold, okay, to Nortel and um, we were given a task to do an SSL um, coder and decoder. And ours was slow. And we'd been working on it a bit, but it was still slow. And it was the day before the big test and Tony came in and had rewritten the whole core thing from start. And I said, no, you're making me nervous. It might not work. And, every, and everybody else says, no, Tony wrote it. It's going to be fine. And they overruled me, and that's fine. <laughs> and it was much faster, and we did win the competition. But um, so, yeah, it's a matter of trust, and it's also a matter of knowing what you're bad at, right? And, and having respect for the people you're working with. And I think they had, uh, with 20 years uh, of age behind, and now if I'm not 20 years older, I think it's pretty amazing that they let me um, do a lot of the sales and do a lot of the commercial stuff and do, make, take a fair number of decisions, although not the technical ones, um, given how inexperienced I was. I think they were great, they're really nice to me. Hmm? Right. Thank you. That was good. Um, I will ask you to maybe stop sharing the screen so that we can see uh, you answering the questions. Uh, um, right. Stop share. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. And we have next question from Krzysztof. Uh, building a company is not only about writing code. So what no. do you think are the necessary skills to be successful at the beginning? Right. So the first thing you need to do is learn your lean startup. Okay because it's really all about customer value. And that's what we did wrong in Bluetail, uh, where you have to find somebody who really has a problem that hurts that you can solve. Okay? And doing that requires a somewhat different personality than most of the programmers I know, where if things are tough and things are going badly and life is kind of miserable and it's raining and, and you've had a fight in the morning, then you should go out and really want to go out and meet a customer. Many of the technical people I know uh, in that situation will want to sit down and code, okay? <laughs> so you need another a person who is willing and happy and able to sell and to listen to the customers and listen to you techies and say, the customer wants this. And you say, no. <laughs> and then the person should understand that. Or uh, the customer wants this. Oh, that's a good idea. Do they want it purple or green? Uh, I'll go back and check. Uh, that kind of a person. It's called pretty much a product manager. You need a salesperson, you need a product manager. You also need somebody who knows something about keeping track of money, about budgeting. Though those, the budgeting people, as long as you're not doing a fintech startup, those people can be hired in very cheaply for just an hour or two a month. But really sales and customer value and tech, those three. Excellent. Thank you for, for good. 
And we have another one from Warren. Mm, for a SaaS product, do you have any tips on how to acquire an initial set of customers? Yeah. Um, let's assume that you have a product that they'd really kind of like to use, okay? If you don't, then you have to go back and start talking to them and seeing what it is that they really want. And if you can tweak your idea toward their idea. But the first set of customers, are, say there are a number of customers of which some of them you'd really like to have and some will be fine and some of them are kind of eh, right? Uh, you need to actually sell to those first customers. You need to sell to several so you're not desperate that any one of them says no at any one time. Okay, so you need to have at least five or 10 leads that you're pursuing at any one time. Uh, the selling process is extremely well described in Spin Selling by Neil Rackham. Okay, Spin Selling by Neil Rackham, that's one of the key books, you gotta got it. Uh, and then generally they will want something for being your first customer. So you say you may have it for much cheaper the first two years, as long as you are our reference or as long as you put your data into it or something that is very valuable to do to you so you do a, a discount deal okay. in order to sell often you'll need somebody in the customer company who is betting their career on you okay it's called a product champion uh, if you find somebody who's got who is willing to install your product and expects that if he or she does, that their career will go better because it's such a great success, take care of that person. Make sure that they actually do win from you. And then keep that relationship forever. Okay? Because they're the ones that helped you. Yep. Good. So to hear another question from Jan, how do you surround yourself with the right people? Well, That's a good question. Um, I have, I happen to like really very technical people. So it's easier for me as a commercial person to find really technical people because I've known so many absolutely excellent technical people that I will get a feeling for whether a person is good or not just by the way they act, right? It's, without really reading their code or anything, I kind of get it, right? Oh, this one's a good one. Um, I find that most commercial people have no idea what a good techie is like, none, okay? And most commercial people have no idea what a commercial, what most technical people have no idea what a good commercial person is like, okay? Just none. Uh, so you want to ask for references. Commercial, if, I, if I'm gonna assume that everybody here is on the technical side, then in order to find references for a salesperson, they need to have sold before. They need to have sold something kind of similar. They can't be selling socks or selling boxes at the uh, electrical, at the appliance store, right? It's got to be something complicated where it's a relationship building and a key account manager, that kind of a thing. You need to have proven, good, fancy track rail record in sales, okay? Salesman of the month, salesman of the year, employee of the whatever, right? That kind of a person. Um, there are, in most places, meetups where you can meet people who have the, the other skills you need. In Stockholm, uh, Stockholm Innovation and Growth has them. They're called Join a Startup. <laughs> okay. uh, there's a, an organization called Antler, which is basically international everywhere. will take a huge chunk of your company, but they'll match you techies with absolutely excellent people who want to jump off their current fancy career at McKinsey and start a company. They can be possibly, it might be worth 15% of your company to get the right co-founder there. Um, otherwise, go hang out with place, in places where these people are. Okay? Go right. to the pool bar, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have quite a few more questions. I will keep them asking. Uh, if we will not manage to answer all of them, and then I hope that Jane, you can also visit our session Q&A tab later and 
address some of them in writing. Yeah. Right, but next question we have here is from Kevin. Mm -hmm. What's your method approach to evaluate a startup idea when it's still just a concept? Okay, my first frame that I put it into is the Porter. Okay, Porter Five Forces. Look up Porter Five Forces on the net. There's a great description. I want them to have, uh, me, myself, and I, I like to have barriers to entry in terms of IP because that gives me and us all time to build a company before somebody copies it. Not everybody cares about that. I also care a lot about having a lot of customers because I've had too many startups. We've only had a few customers and then they negotiate too hard and we get no prices. We get, don't get paid basically much. Uh, those are the ones I care most about, okay? Of the five forces. Uh, the other ones are nice to have as well. At the moment I'm in one low rivalry one and one high rivalry one. It's hard to remember how how bloody awful it is to have not to really know that I cannot trust anybody I talk to in a meeting because it's there's high rivalry. Okay. Oh right, here I am back in high rivalry. But I'll I'll do that. What I care about most is IP, customer value, actually, that I can see it and uh, enough customers, lots of customers, possible. And then I like to feel that the techie is a good techie, right? But, oh, this is gonna work. This person is actually impressive, right? That's important. And they have energy and they have sales skill on the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. <laughs> we have another one from Andre. Mm -hmm. What is your recommendation or experience building a company based on open source products? Is it the same or a different story compared to closed IP based products? It's a different, it's a slightly different story. The main things are exactly the same. You still have to sell your customers uh, something they value, otherwise you get no money, right? So something, is it support? Is it a stable version? Is it uh, good consulting services? Is it a good architect? You know, what, what are you doing that makes it, make this a valuable proposition, right? Uh, for your customers, you start there. And once you know what it is for your customers, then you put together a business model around it. Um, really that way. Um, it's often a good idea to look at subscription models where you don't get a one-time sale because a one-time sale, you get it and you're so happy for about two days and you realize that your bankruptcy date has moved you know, a week and a half. Uh, <laughs> whereas if you have a subscription sale, it's harder in the beginning because you're not getting much money for each one of your customers, but you build up a base of recurring revenue, which means that you really feel after a while safe that you are gonna be able to pay your rent and your salaries. And that, that's a big deal. Yeah, next. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good one. Uh, next one I have here is, uh, so what's the most common pitfalls you see in the early startups? How can people avoid falling into them? Oh, it varies with your personality, okay? <laughs> Everybody has their faults and the companies that I tend to start will generally be a little bit too happy about their technology because I care about the technology and I think technology is cool, right? And so therefore I will care more about that and perhaps not enough about sales, okay? On the other hand, most of the startups tend to have too many salespeople and no product. Um, what other problems they can have? You can have people who are complete assholes and then they've got horrible conflicts in their, in their founding team and that will be deadly as well. Generally, there's three risks, main risks when starting a startup. There's a, the market risk. Nobody wants this. That was Blue Tail's problem, right? <laughs> the next one is that the founders are going are, are, are to split up because it's, it's under a lot of pressure and they don't actually like each other after a while. And the third one is market, tech, market risk and the technical risk that it doesn't work. Okay? You promised a, a cheap way to get to the moon and it didn't quite work. Okay? Uh, and then, so those three, and those are the common ones. Uh, in order to get rid of market risk, do that first, talk to your prospective customers about would they like this? How much would they pay for it? Who would they like to buy it from? 
what is especially exciting about this? Uh, is there anything, but what problem is it that it's, what, what situation would you use it in? Uh, what do you use to fill that situation now? All those questions, okay? That's market risk. Get rid of that so you understand that what you do is doing good. Technical risk, you guys are better than I am. Uh, group risk. Um, it's a good idea if you know each other fairly well before you start the company because it's a tough, tough time. Hmm? Good, thank you. Very useful. And I have quite a few more, so let's keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said you were six weeks from bankruptcy. How long do you think you should cling to an idea before giving up? Oh, uh, we were in the process of selling the company for some time. So that I kept on thinking that uh, the sale would be finished. They couldn't possibly ask any more questions about our bloody contracts or go through our bookkeeping for another two weeks, right? <laughs> Which, but they could. So that's why the, um, that's why the short time frame left. Um, there's a fine line between being persistent enough that you actually give your idea a chance and being stupid about it, okay? Um, I would say in Blue Tail, we were not stupid about it, mostly because the other people were not stupid in Blue Tail. Uh, they were far from stupid. Uh, Given that, um, when you need to give up is when you're not getting any customers who are interested in whatever it is you're doing. You launch a product, you talk to them, and they, they're not snatching, your out of, snatching whatever it is out of your hands. They don't care. You can get meetings because they're nice people, but they're not buying anything, and they're not asking to install it, and they're not pissed about bugs. They don't care. That's a bad sign. Okay, good. And what do you think about team size and especially the maximum amount of founders? <laughs> uh, I will never go with one founder, okay? Mm -hmm. um, because people get stuck, right? You just don't think of all the things, all the different ways through a problem yourself. You need to be a couple, not a couple, uh, two or three people is great. Uh, the biggest I've ever done is, of course, Blue Tail. We were 12. 12 is a lot of people. The reason that worked was because 11 of the 12 had worked together for eons and knew each other, right? And trusted each other and fixed everything together. And then they had me. <laughs> As the odd man out, or odd woman out now. But generally two, three. They should not be married, okay? Don't bring your spouse or your partner in on this. You need to have somebody who has other experience, who's not angry about something, who's still you know, un involved and understands, but they're gonna always be on your side because they're your partner and they have a job somewhere else, right? If they're in the company, then your company fights end up uh, around the kitchen table and that's bad. Okay, giving this as an elixir continue virtual, this will be my next question. What do you think about Elixir? Is, has, it, uh, has Elixir helped some of your businesses? And if so, how? Uh, I don't think much about it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm really not as techy as all the rest of you. Really not. And I was once somewhat, but I'm getting less and less over time. And I've learned that one of the ways to, for me to work effectively with very, very good technical people is to let them have their territory. Right. What I understand from being at conferences like this is that Elixir is extremely good uh, for people who are somewhat younger than I am and know a different syntax automatically. So it looks more like the other languages uh, and yet still has all the airline features. Mm -hmm. That's what I know. Okay. Okay. And is it important that your startup idea is unique, innovative, and nobody has done this before? I'd say that's a matter of experience. Okay, your first one can happily be something a lot of people have done before. My first one was with my big sister. She was 12, I was eight. We 
hand sewed men's ties. Men's ties already existed at that point. We just sold wild, wild ones. And this is back when men's ties were supposed to be very wide and very wild. Um, our daughter, my daughter had, uh, her first one was just baking sourdough bread and selling it to the neighbors. Okay. That is not unique, but it is an awfully good try. It's a very first try, that's just fine. Um, the next step on that is to make something that does something similar so that people have a category to fit it into and then be much better at something that your customers value. Uh, so that your customers, especially if they're big custom, big companies, they can say, okay, we could buy one of these three products and, uh, and then they put one of these little matrices with a green checks on that, you know, it installs quickly and is, everybody understands how to use it and whatever, all the little green check things. And yours is better than the others. That's, that's also perfectly okay. Not having any competitors at all. Well, you know, I think that you probably do have competitors because people don't have a lot of problems that have never been solved before. They solve it some way. Uh, all the dating apps, when my grandparents were alive, uh, I guess bicycles were fairly expensive to start with, but they would still take a bike to the local dance floor and meet all the local possible partners, okay? That was their dating app, right? So it's, you, you have to look at it. There are not all that many needs that haven't been met, that are big needs. I'm, I'm sure there are, are many technical needs that are dependent on a certain generation of technology. But generally human needs, nah, we're the same. Excellent. We have time for one more question uh, in this session. Um, when it comes to investment, what is more important, the energy of the founders or the idea itself? Um, I think Warren Buffett used to say, and I hope you know who Warren Buffett is. He's 90 something now, but he's really good. Uh, he used to say that when you, you have a management team, they need three qualities, right? One is they have to have a lot of energy. Another one is that they have to be very ethical. And the third one is that they have to be very intelligent. Okay. Any two out of the three is a disaster, okay? So imagine you've got energy and intelligence, but no ethics. We know these people from Wall Street, right? Uh, you have energy, you, and uh, ethics, but no intelligence, it's going to be a disaster, right? It's going to, going to do exactly the wrong things. You have uh, intelligence and ethics, but no energy. Well, nothing's, you know, you, 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 all these will be a disaster unless you have all three. And you need all three in all of your founders. Uh, the idea, if it's a good enough founding team, the idea will change. 